Hi, good afternoon. I'm Gregory Vadis, Chief of the, office, of the FCC's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Thank you for joining us for our fifth or sixth uh, state and local government webinar. We know this is a time of transition at the FCC, but we want to ke continue to keep you informed of issues that staff has identified as important to state and local governments. We will be taking questions via email and Twitter, and we really encourage um, you to send questions. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can send your emails to livequestions at FCC.gov, or you can tweet them to hashtag FCC Live. Um, yeah, for those of you on WebEx uh, who have registered, um, the WebEx password is FCC123, all in lowercase. And uh, let me orient you to today's program and quickly run through the agenda. First, we have uh, Patrick Haley, um, Deputy Director of the FCC's Technologies Transitions Policy Task Force. And he'll be uh, speaking about the transition to IP and away from uh, copper. Uh, Jonathan Lecter will, from the, wireli from the uh, Wireline Competition Bureau will be speaking about our Lifeline program. Um, Mark Walker, also from the Wireline Competition Bureau, will be speaking about rural health care. We'll have a little break. And then we'll hear about cramming from um, two bureaus, actually, from our Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau from our Policy Division. And then we'll also hear from the um, Enforcement Bureau on how we enforce our cramming rules. So um, that should give us uh, two good perspectives of, uh, one, how the rules are made, and two, how they're enforced. And then um, we'll, next up, we'll hear about uh, Next Generation 911 and Text to 911 as well. And uh, we'll hear from the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau as well as the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau um, Disability Rights Office because uh, text to 911 is really an a important um, component for uh, folks who are uh, disabled. It lets, it lets them reach uh, 911. Um, then uh, uh, at 3 o'clock, we'll have a presentation on network reliability. And we'll hear from Jeff Goldthorpe, Associate Bureau Chief for Cyber, Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability. Um, take another short break at about a quarter after three. Uh, and then we'll start back up with an uh, uh, update on the incentive auctions. Um, and that'll be from Rebecca Hansen uh, in the Media Bureau. And finally, we'll have an update on infrastructure issues, wireless infrastructure issues from uh, Jeffrey Steinberg, a deputy chief in the Wireless and Telecommunica Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. So I think um, without further delay, I'm going to introduce Patrick Haley, deputy director of the Technology Transitions Task Force. I know uh, some of you out there in state and local government might uh, already know Patrick. He's done a number, I think he's done a few presentations, uh, maybe to our Intergovernmental Affairs um, Advisory Committee, and I think Patrick's done some other things uh, uh, for the commission as well. So uh, we hope this is helpful, and again, I uh, strongly encourage everybody to email us questions or, or tweet them in. Okay, Patrick? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about the Technology Transitions Policy Task Force here at the Commission. I think what I'll do is uh, provide a little bit of background, just some statistics on trends in the industry and what's happening, what the transitions uh, are that are occurring as we speak, uh, talk a little bit about how the FCC views these transitions and specifically about the task force that was created by former uh, Chairman Janikowski uh, in 2012. Um, and all the things I'm going to be talking about have, uh, are, are important consumer and competition issues, uh, and they impact uh, the FCC clearly. There are certainly federal uh, regulatory and policy issues in play here, but they also impact state and local governments as well. Uh, and, and dealing with these issues uh, historically and still has, has always been a uh, sort of a joint responsibility at all levels of government. And so I appreciate the opportunity to talk a little bit about what the FCC is doing uh, and just want to reiterate uh, that we certainly value our relationship with state and local governments and, and look forward to continue working with, with you all on these issues. So in terms of the changing communications landscape, I just thought I'd provide some statistics here. Uh, 
for spending on circuit switch telephone services. This is sort of plain old telephone service as we've all historically known it. Uh, in 2006, uh, we, the industry spent $182 billion uh, on, on, on that service. It's down to $123 billion in spending last year and uh, just over $100 billion in 2016. So the spending uh, on, on, that tech, on the old technology is rapidly declining. On the other hand, spending on voice over IP has gone from $3.8 billion in 2006 to, to $15.9 billion in 2012 and over $20 billion projected in 2016. And as one would expect, spending on wireless services has gone way up from $125 billion up to $187 billion uh, with a projection, projected spending of $254 billion by 2016. So what you see there is clearly a transition from uh, wireline to wireless networks and from the old circuit switch sort of, sort of TDM networks to IP networks. Um, we're talking about gigabit cities, uh, cities where residences and businesses have access to gigabit connections, extremely fast broadband connections, um, not just as a concept but something that's happening uh, in reality from areas like Kansas City to smaller parts of, of Iowa like Cedar Falls or Burlington, Vermont. Um, we have uh, over half of mobile subscribers now have smartphones up from just 16% in 2009. 4G uh, next generation wireless networks will be available to 98% of the country uh, soon. Uh, and it's already available, I think, to, uh, to over 80% of the population. Um, and in addition to the, the spending, I should say on the, on the first three stats, in addition to the spending, um, the amount of customers has gone up 18% a year uh, for voice over IP phone connections. It's gone up 5% a year annually for wireless, and it's dropped uh, almost 10% a year for the traditional wireline uh, uh, connections. Um, and then in terms of wireless, you know, wireless only households now, over a third are wireless only. And I read a stat the other day which was kind of astounding. For adults between the ages of 25 and 29, 60% um, live in wireless only households. So there's no denying the trends, there's no denying that we're seeing uh, some major transitions. Now, when we, look, when we talk about technology transitions at the FCC, um, we think there, there are really three major transitions, and, I, and I've alluded to them already. We're going from wireline to wireless, from TDM, the sort of older networks, the older network protocols, to modern IP protocols, and we're going from physical networks that were copper in the past to fiber networks. Sometimes you'll hear about it, an all IP transition or a transition to all IP. Uh, and I think that's a little bit misleading because it's more than just a transition to IP. That's a part of it, but it's also this transition physically from copper networks to fiber networks and from wireline networks uh, to wireless networks. And the transition, um, you know, offer tremendous benefits. There are the mobile broadband capabilities and all the applications and services and features that we have now uh, are amazing uh, and are things that uh, didn't exist before. Certainly in terms of individuals with disabilities, the, uh, the IP technologies is, uh, is way, uh, the, the, the capabilities of that technology is far surpasses the older uh, communications technologies. Um, and similarly, in the 911 context, you're going to hear about next generation 911. The IP based uh, next generation 911 system offers tremendous benefits in terms of the ability to receive photos and videos and text and all kinds of information, not in addition to just the voice call. So we see there's major opportunities as we transition uh, to, the, to, the, to the future of the communications landscape. But at the same time, we also understand that these transitions have the potential to be disruptive if they're not uh, managed uh, appropriately. Uh, and that's sort of our role, right? We want to promote competition and innovation, and we want to allow applications and new services and technologies to flourish in the marketplace. But at the same time, we have to ensure that as we transition from the old networks with the capabilities that we know and the limitations that we know, that as we transition to newer networks, um, that the, the services and capabilities that we've come to rely on, that we don't in any way take a step backwards. And that's, I think, one of our most important roles to play. So with that in mind, um, the FCC under former Chairman Jenikowski on December 12th <clears throat> uh, created a technology transitions policy task force. And it's a task force that's made up of the senior leadership of the FCC, of, of all of the bureaus and offices. Uh, it's currently under the direction of Sean Lev, who's our general counsel. He's currently the acting director of the task force. And I, I 
put a quote here on the slides from the announcement. It says, the task force will conduct a data-driven review and provide recommendations to modernize the commission's policies in a process that encourages the technological transition, empowers and protects consumers, promotes competition, and ensures network resiliency and reliability. And that's, that's exactly what we're, we're trying to do. Uh, in terms of the process, internally we meet on a regular basis. We try to coordinate all of the efforts on ongoing activities that have any sort of connection to the technology transition uh, and make sure that everyone in the commission is on the same page as, as different items move forward. Um, it's also important to note that you know, we didn't wake up on December 10, 2012 and realize for the first time that there was a technology transition. Right? This has been going on for years. Um, it was a formal step by the by the chairman to organize us internally to work uh, more closely on some of these issues, but you know starting back in 2009 with the national broadband plan where we made recommendations towards uh, moving towards an all IP world, uh, trying to promote investment and innovation and next generation services. Similarly, in reforms to our universal service system, for example, we moved it from a system based on the phone network to one based on broadband, and we've been uh, implementing uh, congressional directives on uh, improving accessibility for individuals with disabilities in an IP world. And you know, going back even further with the voice over IP services where we required those newer services to provide E911 uh, and other, other things that consumers have uh, come to expect. And so certainly we've been looking at this transition uh, and now what we're trying to do is figure out how to go from you know, the, the, this world where we have legacy technology in place and companies uh, are starting to deploy next generation networks and services, and how do we transition seamlessly and smoothly to a world that is all IP, that is uh, driven by wireless technologies, which is clearly where the, where the world is going, but also make sure that uh, all the services and capabilities that people have previously relied on, that they don't lose those services. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, we certainly do value our relationship with state and local uh, organizations, and we're working closely with the NARUC Task Force on Federalism uh, and Telecommunications and other, other groups like that who are interested in these issues. Um, so uh, another quote from uh, the announcement on December 10th when we formed the task force was that technological transitions don't change the basic mission of the FCC. And I think that's an important uh, point. You know, simply because we're changing protocols, going from a TDM network to an IP network, or because we're going from wireline services to wireless services increasingly, or we're changing from copper networks to fiber networks, those are all Im Im important transitions, um, but they don't, they don't change the basic mission of the FCC. And when we look at all these issues, uh, any, any aspect of the technology transition, what we tend to do is look at them from four core values that have always been the core values of the FCC, and that's consumer protection, making sure that you know, consumers uh, are protected and uh, have an expectation that certain services will work, uh, at, and, and other consumer protection issues. Universal service, whether it's a plain old telephone system or an all IP system, everybody has to have access. Uh, and that's going to continue to be a guiding principle for us. Competition. Uh, obviously, we're always uh, in the business of promoting competition and innovation, and that doesn't change. And similarly, public safety. Uh, we want to make sure that folks have access to 911, regardless of the technologies that are out there. Uh, we want to make sure that networks are resilient and reliable and redundant, regardless of the form that those, those networks take. So we continue to be guided by these core, these core values. Um, so in terms of things the task force has done, uh, on December 14th, we put out for comment two petitions that we had received, uh, one from AT&T and one from the National Telecommunications Cooperative Association, or NTCA. Um, both were uh, petitions that were asking us to take some steps to address the, the migration to an all-IP network. Uh, AT&T, in particular, had asked us to uh, initiate a trial, uh, an all-IP trial at a, in a, at a wire center level, um, and so we sought comment on what, you know, what kind of trial uh, they had in mind and what folks thought about the idea of doing a trial. And in those comments, certainly there were a lot of um, policy issues raised by different folks about different aspects of the, of the technology transition. 
which we're reviewing very carefully. Um, we also issued a public notice making it clear that folks that want to come in and meet with us, were, we, we love to have meetings. We have meetings all the time. Uh, we created a docket specifically for folks to uh, participate. Uh, it's docket 13.5. So if you're interested in what people have been saying to the FCC about the technology transition, one way to do that is to go into our electronic comment filing system and pull up the comments in docket 13.5, and I think you'll see some interesting presentations that we've been, we've been hearing. Um, we held a, a workshop on March 18th here in the commission meeting room. Um, and we talked a lot about what the actual capabilities and limitations are of new and emerging technologies to try to lay a, 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 the groundwork for the, the data that we're always trying to get to make sure we have good data as we make policy decisions. Uh, and most recently, um, we issued a uh, public notice, and I want to talk a little bit about that, on May 10th, um, which we're seeking comments on potential technology trials. Comments are due to the FCC on July 8th. Uh, we would certainly welcome uh, any comments that you all may have on some of the proposals that we put forward. And basically, you know, we, we often at the FCC move forward in what we call a notice and comment proceeding, where we will put forward ideas, the public will comment, provide their feedback, uh, and then we will have a series of meetings uh, before we move forward with whatever policy objective we want to, want to tackle. One thing we've done in the past and we're seeking comment on potentially doing here is conducting different trials. Um, and so there's sort of two ways you can do this. Uh, one is to do sort of an all IP geographic trial, and that is all the services that were previously provided in the old TDM format um, to allow a carrier to take an entire area, let's call it a wire center, although it could be a different geographic area, and transition all of those services that used to be uh, TDM services to IP service and kind of see what happens. Are there services that people used to have that no longer work? Um, or does everything work smoothly and it's not a big deal? We think we could learn a lot from doing potentially a trial like that. Um, and so we're seeking comment on a detailed proposal for that. And then we're also seeking comment on some targeted trials um, more issue specific, for example, doing a trial on next generation 911, uh, or doing a trial on uh, an area that goes completely wireless, no longer having a wireline phone capability, for example. Um, and another trial could potentially, we've sought comment on doing a trial based on um, individuals with disabilities. Are there any particular new technologies that we could trial? Um, and then there's some more technical ones that have to do with the way phone services interconnect in, in an IP world, which is more of a carrier-focused uh, trial. But specifically on the ones related to next generation 911 or transitioning from wireline to wireless-only services, um, there's certainly a role for state and local government organizations to, to play in that type of a trial. And we'd certainly welcome uh, ideas and input on, on how we might shape such a trial. Um, how am I doing on time? We're okay. You could... So just for example, a couple different issues that we're seeing out there. Um, AT&T made an announcement uh, several months back uh, about investment that they're making in their wireline uh, and their wireless networks in terms of in investment in their 4G network and in their, their, their uh, fiber to the, to the home network, their U-verse network. Um, and one of the things they said in there was they imagine potentially a quarter of their rural customers, which is several million people, uh, going to wireless only. And so that is the, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at doing a technology trial where you would have an area that is only served by wireless technology and not by wireline technology. Um, similarly, in uh, parts of New York and New Jersey, um, Verizon's network was completely destroyed uh, as a result of Hurricane Sandy. And rather than rebuild the old copper network that was destroyed, they've decided to move forward with a fixed wireless solution. It's called VoiceLink. And it's basically, you know, you mount this antenna on your ceiling like a smoke detector, uh, and it, it connects with the wired infrastructure in your home, and, and you, it's, you, know, you use phone service. So it's, it's, it's a wireless, it's not mobile, but it's a wireless-only solution now. And there is no longer a copper wire going into the home in those areas. 
And so there are uh, you know differences in service capabilities as a result of that. And so um, you know those are the types of things we're looking at. What are the differences in the capabilities as people transition to these newer technologies? What are the benefits? And there and there surely are some. And what are the potential risks of moving to a new service like that, uh, which potentially uh, loses some of the service capabilities that it previously had? And so those are the types of issues that the the task force is looking at and trying to figure out how to tackle. Um, and we're going to do that through our traditional rulemaking uh, methodology, but we're also looking at different technology trials to get some actual on-the-ground data uh, to see the results of, of what actually happens uh, out there in the field. Um, and so, as I, as I mentioned, the comments are due July 8th, and we would certainly welcome any feedback you all have. I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Patrick. That was an uh, excellent uh, overview of um, the uh, issues the Technology Transition Task Force, Policy Task Force, is uh, working on at the uh, Commission. And like Patrick said, we're working across all bureaus on it. Um, NARUC's had uh, input with you guys um, on our Intergovernmental um, Affairs uh, our Advisory Committee. We also have uh, two members um, of that committee. Um, who uh, are from New York City and from Florida, uh, who are also working with the uh, commission and Patrick's folks to give um, input from the state and local perspective. Um, I I want to mention that uh, Patrick's PowerPoint has a lot of excellent information in it and um, all the dates and the uh, docket numbers. That'll go up on the... um, it will go up on the FCC events page, uh, as will all the uh, PowerPoint presentations um, sometime uh, uh, today or tomorrow. And also Patrick had mentioned uh, the uh, March 18th uh, workshop that the task force had, um, Technology Transitions Task Force had put on. That's also, if you go to the FCC.gov uh, slash events, uh, you could search back for all the old workshops, and I think that might be useful. It might be a um, useful thing for some of you folks to take a look at if you missed it. That page is actually good, too, because it has links to the announcement and um, different statements and, and writings on the subjects that I talked about. So um, feel free to send some questions, and I, I think we need a uh, – we have to load a PowerPoint in the meantime. Um, but uh, if anybody has uh, questions, they should email to livequestions at FCC.gov or, hash, or um, send it to us via Twitter at uh, hashtag FCC Live. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Patrick. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Um, great. Thanks, Steve. He emailed it to you. Well, not at my desk. All right. Um, yeah, why don't you start? Okay. okay. All right. All right. Oh, we have it on uh, PowerPoint? Thumb drive. Great. Okay, let me, uh, while we're loading, uh, we just have this one PowerPoint to load while we're loading it. Um, next up, we have um, Jonathan Lecter, and he'll be talking about, from the, he's from the uh, Wireline Competition Bureau, and he'll be talking about the Lifeline program, which is part of uh, our universal service program. And uh, John, it looks like his PowerPoint will be loaded in a second. And Jonathan will probably touch on... Uh, some of the topics that Patrick just spoke about. Great. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. You just need to advance what I want to. Yeah. Okay. Either way. Okay. You can um, use this too if you want. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Jonathan Lecter. I'm attorney advisor and team leader um, in the Wildline Competition Bureau uh, Telecommunications Access Div- Division on the Lifeline team. It's a mouthful. Um, I wanted to first uh, thank all the state and local participants who are on the call. Um, it's literally the case that uh, if we hadn't had your input um, in the years leading up to the uh, 2012 reform order, a lot of the reforms would not have happened. Uh, the states were really a laboratory for a lot of the reforms that we eventually put in place. Um, such as a, a database to eliminate duplicates, um, as I'll reach in, as I'll talk about in the presentation. Um, several states uh, have their own database that are that are still uh, operational and are 
currently uh, eliminating duplicates and preventing duplicates from occurring uh, in the system. So first I want to give you some background on uh, the Lifeline program for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, it was started uh, in 1985 um, to make sure that uh, low-income consumers had access uh, to phone service. The program provided le reimbursement for uh, incumbent Lex uh, to waive the new slick charge uh, that was put in place uh, after AT&T's divestiture. Um, the, so the program preexisted the act, um, and their, um, the program preexisted the act, and it, uh, it um, uh, was reauthorized essentially in the act, or the, the commission was given authority in the act to uh, continue the program uh, under Section 254B. Uh, so Lifeline is provided by ETCs, uh, most of which are designated by states, but there are uh, several states where the state has uh, essentially ceded that authority to the FCC. So in those states, uh, the FCC handles uh, the designations of ETCs. Um, the mechanics of how it works is the ETCs provide service to low-income consumers and are reimbursed from the fund. Um, the current monthly support amounts are uh, 925 uh, in most areas. Um, and on tribal lands, um, for those carriers receiving high-cost support, uh, they receive uh, 34.25. Uh, and uh, consumers uh, can demonstrate their eligibility by uh, showing participation in one of seven um, uh, uh, assistance programs, um, for example, SNAP or food stamps, uh, SSI, Medicaid. Uh, those are the three most common programs that we found consumers come into Lifeline through. Um, the program substantially changed or was added to in 2005 uh, when the commission permitted uh, non-facilities-based ETCs, for example, track phone, uh, to enter the market. But um, there were uh, issues that were uh, came into the program when you have prepaid ETCs not offering, not charging a fee um, under the existing rules. So that uh, started the, the need for a revision of the rules. Um, and not only that, but it also substantially grew the lifeline market uh, because consumers uh, were were happy and satisfied with a service uh, that they could get uh, without a monthly charge and would provide a minimum number of minutes, or a certain number of minutes, rather. So um, in 2012, the, the commission substantially tightened the rules in the program. Um, it confirmed that you can only have one benefit per household, uh, and household is defined as um, uh, people sharing living expenses together. Um, yeah, for the first time, it put in place a nationwide uh, standard that um, ETCs or state administrators have to obtain proof of eligibility from the consumer. This can be either uh, obtained by looking at the consumer's benefit card or, or documentation or by um, obtaining uh, uh, proof of eligibility from the state administrator. There are about 10, 15 or so states that administer the Lifeline program, um, or the consumer or the state itself can ping an eligibility database in the state uh, to determine if the consumer is receiving the benefit that they say they are. Uh, it also put in place certification and recertification requirements so that um, every consumer has to sign a piece of paper saying that they um, agree to abide by the Lifeline rules that they're only receiving one phone per, cust per customer. Uh, and at the same time, they provide, they, they sign this form at the same time and they provide proof of eligibility. Uh, and the uh, consumers also, uh, once a year or on an annual basis, have to recertify their continued eligibility. This can either be done by making the same attestations they made when they certified or by um, the carrier or the state administrator dipping into a database to determine if the person is still eligible. Uh, in the last month, the Bureau released uh, a public notice clarifying uh, some of the issues with timing uh, regarding how often the recertification has occurred. And uh, the 2012 order also uh, said that USAC would perform the recertification process on behalf of carriers that chose to do so. Um, the PN laid out that process, and the ETCs have to select in the coming week uh, whether they're going to use USAC or not or continue to do the recertification on their own. The other major reform, uh, one of the other major reforms was it uh, significantly eliminated link up. That's the one-time um, charge that... Uh, carriers can get reimbursed for the connection charge. Um, and it limited link up to ETCs providing um, providing uh, uh, support on tribal lands, receiving high-cost support. And I, I misspoke earlier. Uh, tribal Lifeline is uh, available to uh, to any any uh, subscriber on tribal lands, not just uh, subscribers receiving uh, on tribal lands with ETCs receiving high-cost support. So that restriction of high-cost support only applies to link up, just to clarify. 
Uh, so some other reforms we've been doing that were somewhat independent of the order is we've uh, directed USAC to continue their in-depth uh, data validation process. That's whereby uh, the USAC would ask carriers uh, in specific states to send in their customer lists. USAC matches the uh, subscriber list together and determines what customers have more than one phone. Um, and they uh, establish a process whereby customers would be given a default carrier or they could also override that selection um, by by uh, giving that selection to USAC in a 30-day a 30, a 30 process after they receive the letter. Uh, the order also, as I mentioned, uh, it directed USAC to establish um, a database to eliminate duplicates. USAC is currently on the process of creating that database. Um, there are five states, as I mentioned, that opted out, Vermont, Puerto Rico, Texas, and Oregon. Um, have opted out, and um, USAC is going to hold a webinar tomorrow uh, to begin the outreach process to uh, to states and ETCs um, regarding the mechanics of how the uh, the database will work, because uh, there are a lot of blanks that have to be filled in um, in, in terms of how how ETCs will provide the subscriber information to the database, how the ETCs will query the database, um, things like that. And we encourage everyone on the call today to uh, log into that webinar tomorrow. I mean, you, you can find out about it on USAC's website. Uh, the order also put in a rule uh, that said uh, essentially prepaid wireless carriers, um, consumers have to use the service within 60 days uh, or they'll be de-enrolled. It also put in audit requirements for first year, for ETCs that are just starting service the first year as well as biennial audits for, ET for ETCs receiving um, $5 million or more in support. Uh, this slide provides um, a summary of uh, the, the changes that occurred in the lifeline order. And as you could see, prior to the order, the, the rules were uh, pretty thin. Uh, and the post order, uh, the rules were filled out. And there were more stringent requirements put in place. Um, the, just to let you know or give you a sense of how um, uh, the savings have affected the fund, the order itself uh, put a target to save $200 million in 2012 uh, compared to what would have been spent in the absence of reform. Um, at the end of this year, of last year rather, we reported that um, uh, we'd saved over $213 million, And the commission projects that um, approximately $2 billion will be saved through 2014 compared to what would have been spent in the absence of reform. Um, and let me go to the next slide. This, this uh, is a good illustration of um, what what reform has done to subscriber counts. Um, as you could see, subscribership peaked um, around July and August. That's when many of the rules uh, started going into effect, including the the uh, requirement to obtain proof of eligibility and uh, to sign the new certification form requirements. Um, the big dip you see between January and February is substantially due to uh, the recertification process. So the con consumers that could not recertify their eligibility by the end of 2012 were de-enrolled in that de-enrollment. Much of the drop between January and February is reflected in that, uh, in that de-enrollment, in that, sorry, drop in the number of subscribers. I want to talk briefly also about um, the broadband pilot, which was also established in the order. Um, uh, they used, uh, excuse me, the, the, the Bureau authorized uh, $14 million uh, in savings to go towards 14, 14 projects uh, in 21 states in Puerto Rico. Uh, they include five wireless broadband projects, seven wireline broadband projects, uh, and two offering both. Um, uh, we're going to test to see the impact of digital, digital literacy equipment types and speed ranges and usage limits have on uh, uptake of broadband amongst uh, low-income consumers. Um, and the the timetable, um, excuse me, there's a there's an 18-month uh, broadband pilot timetable. Uh, began on uh, February 1st. Uh, there'll be an interim workshop in November 2013, um, at which point all the new subscribers will be will be enrolled in the broadband pilot program, um, and the data will be shared with the interested with interested parties uh, and other entities um, which want to use the information on uptake uh, for their own studies. And I'm happy to take any questions. That would be two live questions at FCC.gov. Please, uh, well, we have the experts here. Please uh, feel free to send us those questions. Or if you get, if you uh, think need some time to think about it, go ahead and email it to us, and we'll get it to Jonathan or any of, of our uh, other speakers in a little bit. Jonathan, thank you so much. That was a excellent and thorough presentation, and I know. Um, 
a lot of the timelines in there and goals uh, be we'll put those up on the website I know they'll be helpful to folks so sure uh, people don't need to scramble to write them down sure and I just want to emphasize that um, the, the the biggest learning that I've had in the last year is that you know lifeline is implemented very differently in each state and it's a challenge and it's interesting to try to craft uh, broadly applicable rules that would apply and fit into each state situation but we only know what's going on in the states to the extent that they tell us. So we would really encourage states to come to the Bureau, file ex partes, explain um, how the rules can be better tailored to their situation if it's not working uh, in their situation, um, and just to let us understand um, specifically or particularly how they check for eligibility because that's something that um, we're trying to move to a more autom automated system and to the extent we can encourage states to do so and help them to move in that direction, um, we, would, we would appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Mark Wa Mark Walker. He's uh, also an attorney in the Wireline Competition Bureau, and he'll be speaking about another part of universal service. Mark will be speaking about the rural health care part of the um, universal service program. Jonathan spoke about Lifeline, and of course, there's the uh, what we're calling Connect America Fund, which is traditionally thought of as the high cost area. Um, and then there's also the E-rate part of the uh, Universal Service Program. But today we're hearing about um, Lifeline and uh, rural health care. So, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, uh, Mark, thank you very much. Let me help you get set up. Just click on your... Thank you. Uh, yes, today I am here to discuss the FCC's rural health care program, and in particular, the Healthcare Connect Fund. And then use this to advance. Either way. Or oh, okay. Um, in December of this past year, uh, the, uh, the Commission released a comprehensive reform order of the rural health care program. As part of that order, uh, the Commission adopted three performance goals uh, for the FCC's rural health care programs. Um, they are as follows. Uh, to one, increase access to broadband for health care providers, especially those serving rural areas. Two, to foster development and deployment of broadband health care networks. And three, to maximize the cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness of the, those programs. Um, in addition to these performance goals, the Commission adopted uh, performance measures for the uh, rural health care programs. As way of background, um, I wanted to touch base and provide and highlight the existing uh, rural health care programs. Uh, first, there's the telecommunications program, uh, which the Commission launched in 1997, and it provides uh, funding for the difference between the urban and rural rate uh, for telecommunication services for rural health care providers. Um, this program will remain in place after the Health Care Connect Fund is implemented. Um, and, um, you know, still uh, we still see great value in that program. Um, the, uh, the second program, the Internet Access Program, was established in 2003. Um, it provides a 25% discount on Internet Access services for rural health care providers. That program will end on June 30th, 2014, as participants of the Internet Access Program transition to the Healthcare Connect Fund. Um, the third existing program is the Rural Healthcare Pilot Program, which was established in 2006 and today supports 50 statewide and regional broadband healthcare provider networks, which consist of roughly 3,800 healthcare provider sites um, in roughly 38 states uh, across the country. Um, that program uh, has committed over $364 million um, to these statewide and regional networks, um, and it will um, – those, those, those projects are in varying um, stages of completion. Some are fully implemented up and running, and some are just still deploying their networks. Um, at this point, the pilot program is closed to new sites, but the pilot projects may add new sites under the Healthcare Connect Fund, as I'll discuss here in a second. So, 
So I've, I've uh, alluded a little bit to the Healthcare Connect Fund. Um, it was created in, in this past December uh, in the uh, in the Commission's Rural Health Care Reform Order. So what is the Healthcare Connect Fund? Um, first, who is eligible? Um, public and nonprofit healthcare providers are eligible to participate and receive support. Um, healthcare provider is a is a term defined by statute, and it includes hospitals, rural health clinics, community metal, mental health centers, community health centers, medical schools, and local health departments. Um, what is eligible? The the Healthcare Connect Fund um, has uh, has been created based on the the lessons we learned in the in the pilot program and the great success of the pilot program. Um, so we've made eligibility um, as broad as possible as far as the services that may be supported. Essentially, it's connectivity, um, and that covers broadband services, HCP owned infrastructure, and network equipment. So the broadband services could be anything from Metro Ethernet to T1s to MPLS um, and pretty much anything in between that is connectivity. Um, but the program does not support uh, um, equipment such as uh, you know telemedicine carts or other end user applications or equipment. It's really uh, the, the program is focused on supporting broadband connectivity uh, to healthcare providers. So what is the support level? Um, support level is, is a 65% discount on eligible services. This is unlike the um, telecommunications program, um, this is a flat rate discount, not a difference between the rural and urban rates. Um, when will support become available? Um, for existing pilot projects, they may uh, begin receiving support as of July 1st this year. And um, for all eligible uh, healthcare providers can begin participating as of January 1st, 2014. Um, the application process, like, uh, like the other um, universal service programs, uh, will be run it will be administered through the Universal Service Administrative Company. Um, the application process will be entirely online, and um, that that uh, online application process is in the uh, should be stood up later this summer, and folks can begin uh, applying at that time. Um, for pilot projects, they can continue to use their existing application process uh, to receive support under the Healthcare Connect Fund until the online process is up and running. Um, Mark, can I ask you, uh, sure. sorry, how long does the um, support go once a rural health care provider is in the program, the discount? Um, or is it annual, or how, how, how is it renewed? Uh, there is a, a number of facets there. Um, the program itself is an indefinite program, much like our other programs. Um, for consortia applicants, they may apply for multi-year funding commitments uh, up to three years in length. So this is somewhat new to the uh, Universal Service Program. Um, this is the only program to date that allows for multi-year funding commitments. Um, this should hopefully ease uh, the administrative burden in participating in the program because you only need to, if you secure a multi-year funding commitment, you'll, you only need to come back to USAC basically once every three years. Um, uh, for individual applicants, they um, they are not eligible for the multi-year funding commitment. They would need to come back every year to apply and get a funding commitment. Um, also, I wanted to mention quickly, um, unlike the traditional telecommunications program, both rural and non-rural healthcare provider sites are eligible to participate. Um, rural sites may participate either individually or as part of a consortium. But non-rural HCP sites may participate as part of a majority rural consortium. This is also new and, and recognizes some of the benefits that we saw in the pilot program of the connections between um, rural and urban sites and the value that that, that provides to those health care providers in those rural areas. Um, the, the December order also created the Skilled Nursing Facility Pilot Program. Um, this is a, uh, a pilot program to test how to support broadband connections for skilled nursing facilities. Um, the Commission and the Bureau is in the process of developing and designing that pilot program and plans to get it underway in, in 2014. 
Um, the pilot program is limited to up to $50 million in total over a three-year period. Um, participants will be required to collect data and submit reports to facilitate the Commission's learning of you know, whether uh, it should continue to support broadband connections for skilled nursing facilities. A few resources um, that, uh, that I'd like to draw your attention to. Um, the Healthcare Connect order uh, can be found at the following address. I encourage anyone that's interested in, in applying to definitely read that order. It provides um, tremendous detail as to the application process, eligibility, um, eligible sites, um, all the rules and requirements that go along with the program. Um, I've only been able to touch on just a few of those. Um, it's, a, it's an extensive order, and I would encourage everyone to uh, read that that's interested in the program. Um, the FCC also has a website dedicated to healthcare. Um, there are FAQs there and other resources uh, for um, parties that are interested in the program. Um, also, USAC is developing a similar website that will uh, contain the applications and the application process. Um, and another resource, if you're looking to see what pilot projects may be in your states and your areas, um, is the uh, Rural Healthcare Pilot Program map. It is an interactive map that allows you to zoom in on a particular state or a particular area and see the particular healthcare provider sites that are supported through the pilot program. Um, as I mentioned before, there are roughly 3,800 um, sites across the country. Um, any questions that you may have as far as the application process, um, USAC has a dedicated email address uh, for those questions, and that is listed here as well. Um, I would encourage, you know, we've done a, a lot of outreach on this program, um, but as you interact with healthcare providers in your states and areas, I would uh, highly encourage you to, to uh, at least mention this to them and uh, direct them to these resources. Thanks, Mark. And uh, this uh, PowerPoint presentation will be up there, and I imagine those links will be useful. Um, things as simple as uh, what does rural mean for the program? Uh, we all yes. know the... Um, federal government has a few different definitions of rural for uh, different programs, so you have to, mm -hmm. uh, just because you know what it is in one context, it might be different for this context. Yes, they actually, the commission does have a, a unique definition for the rural health care program. Um, that definition of rural applies to all the rural health care programs, um, but it is unique to the, uh, to the Universal Service Rural Health Care Program. So I would encourage everyone to go to um, USAC has a tool that will help you determine a particular site's rurality, um, and I would encourage you to go there. Thank you. Um, and for any uh, folks uh, 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 watching this uh, live stream in rural areas, I think uh, now's a good opportunity if you want to send some questions. Um, uh, if you need some time to think about it, go ahead and send them in, and uh, I'll be sure um, that Mark gets them. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, we're running a little ahead of schedule. I had uh, built in some time for some uh, for some questions. Um, thus far, we haven't had too many, but I, um, I uh, again feel free to ask. Nothing uh, too large or too too small. Um, you know, we know not everybody out there has uh, telecom only in their portfolio, so please um, uh, feel free to send uh, send in questions. Um, you know, there's no there's no wrong question. So, uh, and, and we only know, you know, we only know um, uh, if we're on point or if something's confusing if we hear from you. So we're going to take a break now, and we'll return at uh, two at 2:05. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, welcome back to the uh, second half of um, the FCC state and local government webinar. And we'll be uh, continuing with cramming. And we have uh, John B. Adams, Acting Deputy Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Policy Division, along with um, Eric Bash, um, Associate Bureau Chief in the Enforcement Bureau. So um, we sort of have a tag team. It'll be nice. We'll uh, 
talk about uh, how the rules are promulgated and what they are, and uh, Eric will discuss um, how they're enforced and enforcement actions that we're taking in cramming. Uh, so hopefully this will be uh, helpful to a lot of folks out there in, um, uh, in uh, attorney general's offices as well as uh, state PUCs and others. So without further ado, let me present John Adams. All right. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, give a brief overview of a uh, cramming workshop uh, that uh, was held here at the commission uh, on April the 17th. Um, it actually addressed both bill shock and cramming, and anyone who's interested can see the entire uh, workshop uh, on the commission's website. Uh, just go to uh, www.fcc.gov slash live and there's a link for past events, and then you can click on the workshop for Bill Shock and Cramming and see the entire thing. <clears throat> uh, we had um, uh, quite a bit of state participation uh, in the workshop, and that was uh, really encouraging to see. And uh, given the audience here, I just wanted to uh, put out a little bit of the information that uh, uh, the states provided to us in that workshop, including uh, just kind of summarizing a couple of studies uh, that have been done by states. Uh, first off, it looks like from what we heard at the workshop that uh, wireless cramming is a concern of the states. Uh, there, We heard that there's a possibility that uh, with the recent uh, emphasis on wireline uh, cramming, that there might be some migration to wireless, and also that uh, consumer complaints are really just the tip of the iceberg of what's actually happening in terms of uh, unauthorized charges, uh, especially on wireless bills. Um, that said, I'll move on to the couple of um, studies uh, that had been done and that were uh, discussed in the workshop. Uh, one was done by the Illinois Citizens Utility Board, um, and they had uh, taken a look at wireless bills trying to identify charges that were deemed suspicious. And that may, may not necessarily mean that they're unauthorized, but they're the sorts of charges that uh, you know, based on uh, experience, uh, suggests that uh, they might be worth taking a second look at to make sure that they actually were authorized. Uh, but in that study, uh, the suspicious charges on wireless bills have doubled in the last year. And more than half of the wireless bills that were examined had suspicious charges. So that was a cause for uh, some concern and certainly, uh, you know, provides, uh, you know, a basis for um, the concern that was expressed about uh, possible growth in wireless uh, cramming. Another study that uh, was uh, discussed at the workshop uh, came from uh, Vermont, and it was a cooperative effort between the uh, Vermont Attorney General's Office and the University of Vermont. Uh, they took a look at a thousand wireless uh, consumers in Vermont uh, to see what uh, you know what they could find about unauthorized charges on wireless bills. Uh, and what they found was that half of the consumers were unaware that third-party charges could even be placed on their wireless bills. And then they found that half of the bills that they looked at actually had unauthorized charges. And in contrast, they noted that since 2006, uh, the Vermont uh, Attorney General's Office had received fewer than 25 complaints of wireless cramming. So, uh, you know, they were stressing the fact that the number of um, complaints really didn't accurately reflect what they saw uh, during the survey. Uh, there is a um, a complete write-up uh, by a professor at the University of Vermont that is uh, publicly available. It's in the Commission's electronic comment filing system, which can be accessed via the Commission's website, uh, and you can look it up. It's in uh, CG Docket 11-116 uh, if you want uh, all of the details on that. Um, 
that's all I have. Uh, I want to leave the rest of the time uh, for Eric. You know, um, let me, I, I think we had one question before we get to Eric. I saw that came in. Uh, so thank you. We have a question from uh, Carlin Reed, Director of Competition of the Competition Division for the Massachusetts Department of Telecommunications and Cable. Um, Carlin said, hi, I was wondering if your program during the uh, cramming session uh, will have information about recent VoIP slamming ruling, uh, saying the FCC does not have jurisdiction over VoIP slam slamming complaints. If the FCC cannot handle this, does that mean states should? do it. Okay. Well, I'm not sure that there is a completely clear answer to that. Uh, the, the current uh, slamming rules um, apply to uh, wireline telephone service, um, but do not specifically apply to VoIP. And unlike the current rules, there's nothing specific from the Commission stating exactly what the role of the state's uh, might be in uh, slamming enforcement. Uh, with wireline service, the states can opt in to um, enforce the FCC's rules and, and can have, um, um, you know, an active role there. Uh, since we don't have a specific statement from the Commission about VoIP, uh, I really can't say, you know, w what really, uh, make, make a statement about what the states should or should not do with respect to VoIP slamming. So, so that would be up to the states. Eric, did you uh, want to go ahead and uh, speak about the enforcement perspective and some of the um, cramming uh, cases we've enforced? Sure. Uh, so as Greg uh, uh, mentioned and introduced me, my name is Eric Bash, uh, and I'm an associate bureau chief uh, in the FCC's Enforcement Bureau. Um, what we do in uh, the Enforcement Bureau, or uh, EB, is we don't do all of the enforcement uh, that the FCC is charged with doing, but we do most of it. Uh, and that involves uh, violations of the Communications Act or other statutes that the agency is charged with enforcing or uh, enforcing rules and orders that are put out uh, by the policymaking uh, bureaus of the agency, uh, including the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau. Uh, and I was asked to uh, speak this afternoon about some of our recent uh, cramming uh, and unauthorized uh, billing enforcement actions. Uh, I wanted to uh, state at the top uh, what law it is we are currently enforcing uh, for cramming violations, and that uh, is a cornerstone of the Communications Act, Title II in the Communications Act. Uh, specifically Section 201B that says all charges, practices, classifications, and regulations for and in connection with uh, communication service by wire or radio shall be just and reasonable, and any such charge, practice, classification, or regulation that is unjust or unreasonable is hereby declared unlawful. That uh, cornerstone has existed in the statute uh, for quite some time. That's the authority that we've been using in the cramming cases that I'm about to uh, speak about. Uh, and that uh, provision is uh, independent of the cramming uh, rules and orders that CGB uh, has been working on uh, over the past few, year, few years, which is why you have seen uh, enforcement action coming from the Enforcement Bureau, notwithstanding uh, that uh, the CGB rulemakings uh, have been proceeding on uh, a, a, a different timeline and in conjunction with work that we're doing. It might also be useful uh, for those of you uh, out there, if there are any of you out there who aren't familiar with uh, the way the FCC goes about its enforcement process, uh, it might be useful for me to give you a bit of an overview of that uh, before I talk about the particular actions. With respect to carriers, uh, there are essentially three general types of enforcement actions uh, that we can and do take. Uh, the first is the uh, issuance of a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture, which comes under Section 503 of the Communications Act. 
there can also be uh, cease and desist orders that involve uh, sort of trial type proceedings or license revocation proceedings, which also involve trial type proceedings that we can conduct under Section 312 of the Communications Act. Uh, the, the actions I'm going to speak about today, um, most of them involved uh, notices of apparent liability. Two of them uh, I'll speak about involve consent decrees that uh, were, you know, obviously uh, we reached a consensual resolution uh, with the targets involved uh, in lieu of needing to issue a notice of apparent liability for forfeiture or NAL. To unpack the uh, NAL a little bit for you, um, first, uh, the maximum fine that we can assess under the statute currently is $150,000 per violation. These are the uh, amounts for carriers. Or $150,000 per day of each day of a continuing violation up to $1.5 million. In determining the amount uh, to assess in any particular case, uh, the statute says that we are to take into account the nature, circumstances, extent, and gravity of the violation, and with respect to the violator, the degree of culpability, any history of prior offenses, ability to pay, and such other matters as justice may require. We often have uh, identified in our forfeiture guidelines or through case-by-case uh, -case adjudication what we call, quote-unquote, base forfeitures for particular violations through case law. Uh, we established a while ago that $40,000 uh, seemed to be the base forfeiture for a cramming uh, or unauthorized billing uh, violation. Uh, the... Um, degree to which we uh, downward adjust that or upward adjust that is dependent upon, upon those factors that I announced uh, uh, just a few minutes ago uh, that govern our decision making about what uh, the amount of the fine is that we should levy in any particular case. Also worth noting that under Section 503b6 of the Act, uh, we have a one-year statute of limitations, so uh, we need to move quickly uh, in our enforcement actions. Uh, in the NAL process, that's a charging document that lays out for the target of the NAL the specific violations uh, that uh, were at issue, um, the facts supporting uh, our allegations that the law was violated. Uh, it's a charging document, but it's also uh, much more than that and sort of brief-like. The target of the NAL has an opportunity to respond, of course, uh, and uh, to explain, uh, you know, why we got the facts wrong, why we got the law wrong, if that's the case. Um, they can't pay the fine and it needs to be reduced uh, for one reason or another. We take all of that into consideration and then we will move forward if we're going to go ahead uh, and impose a civil forfeiture uh, with uh, issuing a forfeiture order, which represents the uh, culmination and completion of the administrative uh, process here at the agency. Uh, if the target does not pay, uh, the forfeiture order, then we um, are statutorily required to send that to the U.S. Department of Justice uh, for collection. Uh, so with all of that introductory stuff <laughs> out of the way about the law that uh, we are enforcing in these actions as well as the process uh, that we uh, use and the enforcement vehicle we use, let me get into uh, some of the actions that we've taken. Um, in the last several years, and I'm uh, really focusing on the actions that we've done in the last two and a half years, uh, because that really is the, the, the period of time during which we have uh, begun to take uh, a number of actions in this area. There was a case a while ago, uh, but we've really been uh, stepping it up uh, since uh, 2010. So the, uh, there have been eight actions uh, in the last two years. Uh, and they have involved actions against both third-party carriers uh, as well as against uh, billing carriers themselves. Uh, and the, there have been five uh, cases against the third-party carriers, and the NALs in those cases, four of them, were released uh, on the uh, exact same day uh, back in 2011. Uh, and what was involved uh, in these cases was that uh, the carriers were offering a dial around uh, long distance service. So they had access to local exchange carrier billing platforms, uh, assessed a charge of I think it was around 10 or $15 per month, 
uh, for carriers to have the ability to use their long distance service uh, to make calls. And uh, we received uh, hundreds of complaints about these particular entities from consumers who claimed that they had uh, no knowledge of the company, they had never heard of the company, they had never asked for the service uh, that the company was charging them for on their phone bill. And uh, interestingly, we learned in the course of the investigation uh, that with respect to two of these companies, although the company had been charging uh, consumers thousands of consumers each month for its service. In fact, only about 20 uh, consumers were using its service over the course of the year that pre uh, preceded the NAL. That uh, fact in and of itself, of course, does not prove uh, absolutely that the carrier did not have the authorization from consumers uh, to uh, bill for this service, but it certainly raises some serious questions. Uh, the targets are defending uh, the action. Uh, the proposed uh, resolution at this point to those cases has been the uh, proposal of $11.2 million uh, in forfeitures, and that's uh, the uh, total of the four NALs that were issued against uh, each of these targets. Uh, the fifth case uh, that we've taken against a third-party carrier uh, in uh, recent months was uh, an NAL that we issued just uh, late last November, I think it was, against a company, uh, Tel7 was the name of the company, also Calling10 and its principal, uh, Patrick Hines. Some of you um, may be familiar with the, uh, the names I'm mentioning because he has been the subject of state law enforcement action as well. Uh, what was involved in this case um, is that uh, the target had acquired a substantial volume of uh, toll-free numbers from uh, entities that, well-known entities, that no longer had the number or the number was sort of a one-off from a number that was is currently used by a well-known entity. In other words, the, the uh, apparent objective of the uh, Num of, of the, the scheme to get these numbers was to select numbers that consumers would likely call by mistake due to the fact that the numbers had been used by, uh, you know, for example, Macy's, let's just say, previously or because the, the uh, number was just one digit off from Macy's uh, toll-free number. Uh, upon calling, uh, misdialing uh, the number, the consumer would hear uh, a message that uh, said a number of different things, but the uh, goal was to get the uh, consumer to call yet another number uh, in order to uh, take advantage of the target's uh, quote-unquote enhanced number assistance and directory assistance or ENADA service. And what was supposed to happen upon calling that number was that the consumer would be given uh, some additional information about the number they had called in the first place, for example, uh, that the phone number uh, was not working, uh, but you would be charged uh, for that. Uh, we again received a substantial number of complaints about this practice from consumers uh, claiming uh, that they uh, either had not called the second number that the you learned about when you uh, made the misdialed call in the first place, or in some cases, consumers were saying that they, they had never called uh, the original toll-free number at all. Uh, so because these were uh, charges for unauthorized service, that's a cramming action, and uh, we proposed a $1.7 million NAL uh, against uh, the company uh, and its principals. Uh, so the collective value of uh, those five actions that I just mentioned against third-party carriers uh, is about $13 million uh, in proposed forfeitures against those five companies. Uh, turning now to actions that we've taken against billing carriers, uh, so in other words, against carriers for uh, their own charges on their own bills, uh, there have been three of those. Uh, the the uh, most recent one of which uh, was just uh, last month against a company called Advantage uh, Telecommunications. Um, and while this was a 
a cram, as I said, uh, that the, the billing carrier was charging on its own bill um, for uh, services. It seems to have grown out of like a third party attempt to get a charge on a bill because what appeared to be happening in this case or our allegation of what's happening in this case is that the company uh, and its telemarketers were slamming uh, consumers, so changing their uh, long distance carrier without permission. But if the slam didn't work or was rectified, in other words, if the consumer uh, transferred back to their original carrier or if the slam didn't go through in the first place, uh, this carrier would simply uh, begin, we allege, uh, billing directly uh, for its service uh, to the consumers affected. Of course, this prompted a lot of complaints again for us to uh, examine. And between the slamming violations that we allege took place, the cramming violations we allege took place, and also truth in billing uh, violations that we allege took place, we proposed a $7.6 million notice of apparent liability uh, against that carrier. Uh, the other two actions that I wanted to uh, highlight today involve CDs, uh, two CDs, uh, one each with uh, two of the nation's largest carriers. And these uh, involve issues that are associated with uh, these carriers' uh, data plan, uh, billing for their, their data plans. Uh, the first was in uh, late 2010 uh, with Verizon Wireless. And what was at issue there uh, was uh, had to do with uh, the company's uh, pay-as-you-go uh, customers. And uh, the company was billing. Uh, these customers uh, erroneously for uh, things relating to the fact that m maybe the, the customer's, f uh, an application on a customer's phone uh, inadvertently and without any action on the part of the uh, consumer was accessing the carrier's data network um, or the consumer was uh, accessing uh, the carrier's uh, billing website, which while that was um, a data session that was in fact initiated by the consumer that was not supposed to be uh, something for which the company or for which the customer was charged. The uh, resolution of that, as I say, uh, was in a consent decree. Uh, there were refunds of uh, over fifty million dollars uh, given to around fifteen million customers uh, who were affected by this type of practice. There were robust uh, compliance efforts. Uh, required and there was a $25 million contribu a voluntary contribution to the U.S. Treasury. A voluntary contribution uh, is uh, a payment that is made in our settlements that's in lieu of a uh, civil forfeiture penalty. Uh, and the second of these cases uh, involved AT&T. That matter was resolved uh, just last year. And again, this uh, grew out of issues associated with the company's uh, data services. Uh, to um, make a long story short, uh, AT&T, as uh, other carriers have done uh, recently, uh, requires uh, smartphone users or certain smartphone users to have flat fee data plans. So a pay-as-you-go data plan would no longer be available. Um, existing smartphone subscribers at the time this policy went into place uh, were intended to be uh, exempt from the new requirement, at least for a period of time. Uh, and so if you were a subscriber who had an existing pay-as-you-go data plan and you needed to replace your phone through uh, insurance or warranty redemption, for example, the idea was, per AT&T uh, policy, uh, was that those customers would not be converted to a mandatory uh, flat fee data plan upon acquiring the new phone through those means. Um, in fact, uh, what our investigation uh, uncovers uncovered was uh, that there were, in fact, uh, some folks uh, being switched to a mandatory flat fee data plans in those instances. That's what we've alleged. Uh, and the uh, resolution to that uh, matter was that there, uh, the company was required to notify uh, its customers about this problem, uh, issue refunds uh, if requested, and there was a $700,000 uh, voluntary contribution made to the U.S. Treasury by the carrier there. Um, I uh, 
I think that's it uh, for me. But I do want to um, make sure that um, you out there have uh, the contact information uh, of me and uh, Richard Heinemann, who is the chief of the Telecommunications Consumers Division, uh, which generates a lot of this work, as well as his deputy, uh, Kim Wilde, who oversees cramming enforcement-related work. Uh, again, my name is Eric Bash, 418-2057. Uh, uh, Rick Heinemann, 418-3613, Kim Wilde, 418-1324, and our email addresses are all our first name, separate, separated by a period, and our last name uh, at FCC.gov, and we certainly uh, welcome hearing from you uh, about matters of mutual interest. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and uh, thank you again, John. Um, both Eric and John have uh, participated in our in uh, past state and local government webinars. So uh, thank you for um, hitting on interest uh, to the state and local governments. Um, as I mentioned before, not everybody has uh, telecom as their sole uh, portfolio out there. So um, we've had input that these uh, webinars and updates are really, really useful. So thank you for your time and expertise. Um, next up, we're going to speak about um, uh, Next Generation 911 and uh, Text to 911. Uh, and we're going to have um, Aaron Garza, uh, an attorney in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, as well as uh, Susie Rosie Singleton, an attorney in the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau's uh, Disability Rights Office. And I should mention, if anybody's out there watching on um, WebEx as opposed to the FCC's live stream, and they're having difficulties with the audio, they could just switch over, go to the FCC's uh, events page, and click on the uh, live audio feed and watch the presentation um, through there. So let me get, get your presentation up. Uh, here it is. is it take now? Yes. Great. I think who's going to kick it off? Aaron? I'll start. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you could. Slide it. This? Either way. Oh, go ahead and say, doesn't it need to be in slide? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, you can. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the, the webinar. We're glad that we can present to you today. Susie and I are going to discuss um, the commission as well as private corporations and state and local governments. Um, efforts to make the, nine, the nation's 911 system more accessible uh, to persons with disabilities. And the, the Commission has been committed to, our, to uh, improving the accessibility of the 911 system, specifically as we begin to transition nationwide to a next generation 911 system, um, which is going to leverage um, IP based technologies to provide, nine, uh, to provide photos, videos, and text to 911. And, and more specifically, what we've focused on in, in the interim as we make this transition, uh, recently we've been focused on text time on one and allowing uh, consumers to send um, text to the 911 system. And so if you look at the first slide, I thought it might be helpful to um, go just provide a brief overview of the commission's role in 911. And as, as you can see from this slide, uh, the FCC's primary role is regulating the provision of 911 by commercial providers, that is, wireless providers, wireline, VoIP, um, certain text providers as well. Um, and, and as far as the, the public safety answering point or the, or the 911 call center, a PSAP, that's primarily regulated at the state, local, and tribal le uh, level um, with assistance from the Department of Transportation and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Um, so the Commission is focused on ways to improve the accessibility of the 911 system uh, using um, uh, our, our ability to, to regulate commercial providers. Um, and Susie is going to cover um, more specifically what we've been working on recently. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone. First, I want to say thank you to Aaron for giving the overview and starting us off. And before we, we start to discuss Next Generation 911, I'd like to give you a bit of background information. 
the FCC has a strong commitment to the people who have disabilities um, overall. We do have a disabilities rights office, which I'm the attorney of from that office. Again, my name is Susie Rosen Singleton. And on October 8th of 2010, we enacted the 21st Century Communications and Video Accessibility Act, the CVAA. And the purpose of that act was to increase access for the people who have disabilities to modern communication and to maintain the rules and enhance the rules for 911 services in order to achieve equal access to emergency services. And one of the mandates of the CVAA is to create an, an advisory committee to the FCC, which is called the Emergency Access Advisory Committee. And that committee was uh, established on January 2011. And that was to focus on various recommendations for best practices to ensure that emergency services are accessible. One of the EAAC's recommendations was to require uh, text to 911, and they recognized that there was a great need for this type of service, not just for people who have disab disabilities, but for people who also can't use the phone and have various situations where they may be in a domestic violence situation or uh, a situation where there's no voice ability that they can use or it's an unsafe environment for them to use their voice. So there is a need for those people as well to use this service. And with that in mind, we started the rulemaking process um, for it. And then if we move to the next slide. While the rules were being made and being proposed, um, the, the various states, as you can see from this map, you could see different states that were deploying different trials for text to 911. And you can also see that it ranges um, from 2009. Um, you saw Iowa doing trials. You saw that there were some towns, um, some that were done, being done statewide, like Maine. So it really depended on the certain carrier. And for example, within Maine, we had Verizon, um, who was serving the entire state um, for this capability for text to 911. And you can also see that the, there's no consistency here. It's not uniform um, from what's being done. And so this was, again, uh, on a voluntary basis at that point. So, Aaron? Well, as Susie mentioned, there have been s numerous very successful trials with Text to 911 that have provided critical Text to 911 services in the areas that they've been tried. Um, and building on those successful trials in December of 2012, uh, the four major wireless providers, AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, and T-Mobile, entered into a voluntary commitment with the National Emergency Numbering Association and the Association of Public Safety Communications Officials to enable the ability uh, to implement text to 911 on their networks by May 15, 2014. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that text 911 will be available nationwide on that date um, because the voluntary commitment makes it uh, require, uh, would be based on a PSAP request for service, meaning that it's up to the discretion of the local PSAP who has the best sort of I idea of what, of what, they can cap uh, what they're capable of doing in their local area uh, to implement text 911. And because it's not going to be nationwide, there are going to be places where somebody can text to 911, where maybe in the next county over, they're unable to, te to text to 911. And in those cases, the, uh, the carriers com uh, committed to implementing what's called a bounce back message capability. And what the bounce back me message capability basically says is that if you attempt to text to 911 in an area where text to 911 service is unavailable, you receive an automatic message back that says, text to 911 is not available, please contact emergency services by another means. And, and this sort of interim step as we transition to text to 911, uh, we think is very important towards alleviating any consumer confusion about whether text to 911 is available in their area. And it's very important that a consumer understands that if they text to 911, 
they might not actually have reached emergency services. And so we expect the bounce back uh, message capability for the under the voluntary agreement to be um, implemented by June 30th of 2013. And building on that voluntary commitment and on the successful trials, uh, the commission uh, issued a further notice of proposed rule rulemaking, um, which proposed several uh, several regulations re re uh, regarding text 911, uh, building many ways on the voluntary commitment. So we propose to require that all CMRS providers, not just the major four, as well as certain text messaging providers, which I'll get into further in a bit, um, by May 2014 must provide text to 911 service by PSAP request. Um, we also require, uh, propose to require a bounce back message capability by June 30th of 2013. Um, and, and so the, the comment cycle recently closed on that. We're examining these issues uh, further. But our first step in examining these issues was to uh, was last month to issue a report and order which required um, bounce back messages bounce back message implementation by September 30th of 2013. Um, by September 30th of 2013, we require that all CMRS providers, as well as providers of certain text messaging services, um, send an automatic reply message and. Reply message in situations where a consumer attempts to text to 911, where text to 911 is unavailable. The bounce back message requirement that we adopted does not require specific language. Um, however, we do require that they um, inform consumers of two things. First, that text to 911 is not available. And second, that they direct consumers to use another means to contact emergency services. Um, as an illustrative example, uh, in in the, in, the, in the bounce back order, we, we provided language that said, there is no text to 911 service available, make a voice call to 911, or use another means to contact emergency services. And that was an illustrative exa example of a bounce back message that would uh, communicate the information that we felt was the most important for a consumer to receive uh, in their bounce back message. And so earlier I, I alluded to the bounce back message uh, applying to all CMRS providers as well as providers of certain text messaging services. Uh, and what we're talking about there are interconnected text messaging services. These are, are mostly over-the-top applications that are, that are downloaded by, um, by an individual on, on, their, on, on their phone um, that enable consumers to send text messages to and receive text messages from all or substantially all text-capable U.S. telephone numbers. And because many consumers expect that those applications uh, would provide text, to nine, te text service um, generally as well as text to 911 service, we felt it was critical to include those text messaging services in, any in, in our bounce back requirement. Um, so that was really the first issue that we, that we covered with, with, in terms of text to 911 as we transitioned to a fuller transition to text to 911. But there are um, remaining issues that still need to be um, discussed and analyzed, and I, I think Susie is going to cover those. Yes. Next slide, please. Thank you. And there are outstanding uh, text to 911 issues that are out there, and that's because of the the order is the bifurcated, and we've already issued an order as of May 8th to focus only on the bounce back messages and the requirements there, and we hope to have that release, uh, uh, the second order released sometime this fall or in the near future in order to address these issues that you see on the slide. So the first is, should all the carriers of interconnected text services be required to provide text to 911 services? And the second question, you can see, what are the deadlines? And third, what are the technical costs and considerations that would then come into play for those types of requirements? And we, we will have clarification on that shortly. Next slide. And for now, it's important to really emphasize to your constituents uh, three major points. First, that in the event of an emergency, you should always make a voice relay or T2I call um, if possible. 
Uh, relay services typically are available for people who are deaf or hard of hearing or have a speech disability. And for TTYs, they can use that if they have one or other means that they've been using up until this point, that they continue to use those means until text to 911 is widely available. Second, the second point that you see here is in most cases now you can't reach 911 using text to 911. Um, hopefully that will, that will be, um, we'll have that available uh, shortly in the near future. And the FCC um, will also be keeping you informed about that. You can also check our website, which is listed here. We do have the text to 911 website. More information that's there, and that will be continuously updated with further information. And there's also an American Sign Language video that's available for people who are within the community that could benefit from it. And you can also see that there is captioning as well as a voiceover with that video. So for more information, feel free to always contact either Aaron or myself. And Aaron is listed here, as you can see on the slide. Or is not listed here on the slide, as you can see. But um, you c he can be reached at Garza at FCC.gov. And with that, uh, should we take any questions or? Uh, uh, as always, please uh, feel free to send questions to live questions at FCC.gov or hashtag um, or to send them via Twitter, uh, hashtag FCC live. And I, I think this is great. And we're going to continue to do a, a lot of, uh, the commission is going to continue to do a lot of outreach on this. I'm sure uh, anybody under 30 expects to just send a uh, if uh, send, expects to send a text or snap a picture, uh, snap a photo of a license plate on their car phone, uh, uh, of a car uh, license plate, and send it on their uh, their smartphone. And um, the, you know, PSAPs may not have the capability to handle it yet. So even though uh, the four large carriers will be ready, um, if the PSAPs aren't ready yet. You know, the uh, it's not going to do any good, and the outreach campaign is a huge part of what we're going to be doing at the commission. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Next up, we have um, Jeff Cold Goldthorpe, uh, Associate Bureau Chief in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Uh, Jeff is uh, Associate Bureau Chief of Cybersecurity and Communications Reliability. And he's going to talk about network reliability, resiliency, and um, to say the least, it's been a heck of a year. <laughs> Here we've had uh, the the, the uh, Public Safety Bureau do the derecho reports, and then the um, the field hearings beginning uh, um, in New York uh, after Superstorm Sandy and continue throughout the country. So um, we're very lucky uh, that Jeff has made time for us today, and uh, he's going to talk about network resiliency and reliability. So let me put get Jeff on. Let me get your. Uh, oh, Jeff's just going to speak. Actually. I'm just going to speak. So you just have me today. Right. <laughs> it's perfect. Thanks, Greg. Thank um, you very much. Thanks for the uh, invitation to speak. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And as Greg said, I'll be talking about network reliability, and particularly the things that the commission has been doing over the years and over the last year in the area of network reliability, and and uh, and in uh, uh, more focus on 911 reliability. Now, um, uh, since I've been at the Commission, and, and even before that, I'm sure, but since I've been here, I'm, I'm familiar with an approach that we've taken to um, addressing communications reliability that has two tiers to it. Um, on the one hand, we have a Federal Advisory Committee. It used to be called the Network Reliability and Interoperability Council, ENRIC. And it's currently called the Communication Security, Reliability, and Interoperability Council, CISRIC. Um, and, uh, but it has um, some of the same purposes. It's gotten a little bit broader over the years, but it still does things like uh, best practices to help sustain and improve communications reliability. It's gotten into more into cybersecurity, and I'll get into that in just a moment. But, um, but over the uh, most of its tenure, since 1992, ENRIC and then CISRIC has developed voluntary operational 
best practices. If you're in the communications sector, if you're at a communications provider, for example, you might consider these to be methods and procedures. They're the kinds of things that get used by um, technicians in the field, by um, people in operations support centers that, um, that keep the network running. And uh, what the best practices are, are, are the best of the breed, the best um, practices that are in use out there today. And, and we, um, the, the CISRIC and the members of the working groups of the CISRIC arrive at those through a collaborative process um, consisting of practitioners. The people that are doing this work are people that work in these areas every day. And they get together and they, and they talk about what are the best ways to do them, what are the best ways to do um, you know, circuit resiliency, what, what are the best ways to, present, to prevent outages, what are the best ways to improve 911 reliability and develop best practices in those areas. And those are all published. They're publicly available. And there's a lot of them. There's about, I'm going to say, a thousand best practices in use today. We did go through an effort a couple of years ago in CISRIC to try and um, prioritize the best practices, and that's also available on the CISRIC website. Um, but um, but that's, that's half the story. That's the best practices. They're voluntary. We don't have any rules right now that make that, that force anybody to implement any best practice. And um, one of the reasons for that is because the conditions under which they would be implemented vary depending on the, on the conditions that a service provider operates in. So it may or may not be relevant or appropriate to implement a best practice everywhere. So we, uh, we have left it up to the discretion of service providers to implement them. What we have done, though, is, is to also implement a mandatory outage reporting um, regime that requires uh, covered pr uh, communications providers to report to us when they have an outage in their networks, a service outage that, that exceeds certain thresholds. These are pretty high thresholds, but we still get a lot of data. Um, the, we, we tightened the thresholds a little bit in 2004. Um, we, in, we increased the coverage to include interconnected VoIP providers a year or so, to maybe two years ago. So um, we actually got quite a bit of data now, and the good thing about that is that it doesn't take us very long to spot trends in the adage reporting data that cause us either to be concerned or to be happy, one or the other. The, the trends that are troublesome are obviously the trends where outages are going up in a way that, that can be determined to be statistically significant. So we don't jump to action when we see the line start to go up. We, um, we take um, action when we can tell um, in a scientific way that there really is a trend, and the action that we take is, um, has always been to bring communications providers in to, um, to work with us on ways that, that um, reliability can be improved. These have always been voluntary, collaborative um, initiatives. <clears throat> they tend to work because we continue to get data. If we see a trend in a certain area, we, uh, we work with communications providers, uh, we can usually see the trend improve over time. And, and the fact that we will continue to get that data and watch it is sort of a, uh, um, if not a compelling event, it actually creates some incentive to, um, to bring the, uh, the number of outages down. Um, so that's a process that we have followed since about 2004, uh, well, since 2004 to be precise. Um, we have um, extended the scope of this work and this process to include cybersecurity the work of CISRIC 3, the last CISRIC, for example, included a lot of, um, of uh, initiatives in cybersecurity, all voluntary, and uh, just as it had been um, in the years preceding that. Now, um, let's talk about the last year. Things have been a little bit different in the last year. About a year ago, almost to the day, we had the derecho that, uh, that Greg mentioned. The, the derecho was a, a intense storm that affected this area, the, the metropolitan D.C. area, um, as well as areas in uh, West Virginia and further west. And um, one of the things that um, we documented in the report that we issued back in, in January was the, um, the um, I'll say, the oversight, the omission of implementing what we would call critical best practices. And, and now I'm talking specifically about 911 best practices, things that are important 
that be done in order that 911 service is provisioned in a, revo- in a reliable manner. So uh, if you've seen that report, you'll know that uh, there were a lot of things that weren't done prior to the derecho. The derecho was unusual in that it was sort of a pop quiz. It wasn't like a hurricane that was uh, drifting up the coast over the course of several days. It came at lightning speed, and um, so there really wasn't much time to prepare. It was it, The networks performed as they did at that point in time, and um, uh, and so in the derecho report, you'll, uh, you'll see what our findings were, and uh, you will also – see that our conclusion in that report was that the commission should take some further steps to deal with the findings in the report. We uh, issued a notice of proposed rulemaking after the publication of the report. That report came out and the record closed a month or two ago and um, uh, we uh, we are now in the process of uh, reviewing that record, the record that's come in on the docket for that um, for that proceeding. So, um, uh, so that so that has happened, and um, and time will tell what the commission will decide to do with that uh, with that proceeding. Um, uh, Greg also mentioned the Sandy Sandy um, the Sandy uh, superstorm and the field hearings that we had. Um, we uh, uh, we learned a lot from Sandy. We learned a lot about things like um, things that, uh, in a way, they weren't. Learnings. We knew that they were out there, but but we got some data on the impact of of, um, of a storm like this on um, on uh, the reliability of communications regarding communi- uh, consumer backup power. So um, interconnected VoIP and ha- has been around for some time, and there are all kinds of other services. Not really even services. These are devices. Um, you know, wireless phones in homes. I'm not talking about. Wireless, uh, cell phones. I'm talking about just um, you know um, wireless phones that people use in their homes are not um, what what used to be called lifeline phones that were that were um, powered from the central office. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot about communications today that's different from the way it was 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and uh, so that's one of the things we learned from Sandy was just how much about communications. And in that one area, um, backup power, uh, consumer electronics power depends on the availability of commercial power. Um, we learned a lot about um, how communications providers can work together to share assets um, to um, to help to um, reduce the impacts of the storm on uh, communications, on the availability of communications. Um, and and uh, so there's any number of other things that we learned through the field hearings we are going to be starting a new CISRIC. We've chartered the new CISRIC, CISRIC 4. It will begin meeting soon. Um, we have the membership already identified, and there was a public notice issued about that recently. But um, you'll see when the, when the uh, word comes out that the working groups that we, um, that we set up uh, in CISRIC 4 will include a number of issues that came to our attention through, um, through Superstorm Sandy. And, and in particular, a number of the ones that I just described. So, um, so I think that about does it for for what I had prepared to say today. And are we taking questions? We, we are, and we uh, encourage uh, anybody to send it, send your questions to um, livequestions at fcc.gov or uh, tweet them in to hashtag uh, FCC Live. Um, if you need some time to think about it, go ahead, and uh, I'll get any any of your uh, questions, concerns, whatever, to, to uh, Jeff and his team over in the Public Safety Bureau. Okay. Uh, we know you've had a busy year, and uh, with the field, I guess we should also mention the field hearings weren't only related to hurricane-prone areas. We yeah, did one in the middle of the country in Tornado yeah. Alley and um, out on the West Coast where uh, uh, we have uh, earthquakes, so um, seeing how the uh, communications infrastructure holds up under different types of natural disaster. And uh, thank Jeff and his team. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Okay. That's great. Thank you. I actually, uh, we're just a couple of minutes before our next um, break. So uh, why, I guess some of you folks might have uh, Built the break in, so why don't we? Why don't I don't want anybody to miss our next presentation on incentive auctions at uh, at um, 
325. So why don't why don't we go ahead and take our scheduled break in case some of you had phone calls or something else scheduled for them, and then and we'll resume at uh, 325 with um, Rebecca Hansen's uh, update on incentive auctions. And I know Rebecca has. Um, uh, 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 participated in the, in the uh, webinar before, but I think there's some uh, updates. She'd like to uh, let everybody know what's going on with incentive auctions. Thank you. And then the move to free up spectrum. Thanks. Hi, uh, welcome back for the final portion of uh, today's uh, uh, state and local government webinar. And uh, we'll be picking up with an um, uh, update on incentive auctions given by uh, Rebecca Hansen, um, a senior advisor and attorney in the um, FCC's Media Bureau. And um, incentive auctions are basically a way, uh, a voluntary way for uh, broadcasters to relinquish um, some of their spectrum for cash if they choose to do so. And that spectrum would be repurposed for um, basically talking about mobile broadband. And uh, I'll let Rebecca uh, say that, <laughs> give the details of that. Okay, thanks, Greg. Is this on? Yeah, no, yes, it is. Um, yeah, as Greg said, um, uh, incentive, the concept of an incentive auction is to solicit volunteer, volunteers that are occupying Spectrum currently to participate in an auction by which we would share the proceeds of auctioning their Spectrum off um, with them. And the reason we're at the point where we need to explore this mechanism is because currently all the spectrum that is most attractive to wireless companies for wireless broadband is occupied. And so we're at a stage in um, our uh, spectrum management evolution where we need to go back and look at the other parts of the spectrum and determine which frequencies are occupied um, and w which of those frequencies would have occupants that would be able to be incentivized to move off and contribute their, their spectrum um, to, to an auction. We believe that a market-based mechanism is the best way to determine where spectrum will be most highly valued. So by offering auction proceeds, to incumbent users of spectrum, of spectrum on a voluntary basis, we're allowing market forces to determine the price at which a broadcaster in this instance would be willing to give up its spectrum. So I gave a, um, an overview of the incentive auction last year, a few um, uh, it was about a few months after the after Congress implemented the uh, Spectrum Act. The Spectrum Act is the legislation that Congress passed in February of 2012 that authorized us to conduct incentive auctions. The reason we needed this special legislative authority is because while the FCC has had for 20 years now or so um, – the ability to auction spectrum to the private sector, the proceeds of those auctions always needed to go straight to the Treasury. And we were never authorized to share those proceeds with anyone other than the Treasury until February of, of 2012. Um, so I gave a little overview of the Act last year at this, um, this webinar. And since then, we've made a lot of progress in implementing the Spectrum Act. Uh, the first big step there was that in September um, of 2012, we issued a, a very broad-reaching notice of proposed rulemaking on the incentive auction, which covered a wide range of topics from um, the reverse auction to the forward auction to the new band plan to how we're going to repack the broadcasters. And I'll go over those topics in a, in a few minutes. Um, so where we are now, we, we, we issued the NPRM, and we had many months uh, for public comment. Those comment periods have closed, um, and now we are analyzing the comments we received through that process um, in order to refine our proposals um, for how the auction will work. And once those proposals are refined, we'll be submitting them to the commissioners and uh, 
our goal is to, so that the commissioners can adopt rules this year in 2013 and um, with the goal of holding the auction in 2014. And we have a number of objectives that we're trying to meet in running this, this auction. Uh, first and foremost, we want to move more spectrum to wireless broadband services because there's heavy demand and increasingly heavier demand in that sector um, for wireless communications and the spectrum that fuels that. As part of the National Broadband Plan, we concluded that there's likely to be a spectrum shortage that starts in around the you know, late 2014, definitely the 2015-year time period. And in order to get more spectrum out into the market to avoid shortages in that area, uh, we, we need to do this, this auction now. Um, while we are seeking broadcasters to contribute their spectrum back, that doesn't mean that we don't still value broadcasting. In fact, one of the goals of this auction is to provide for a healthy broadcast industry going forward, and we think that will happen through the capital infusion that some broadcasters will be able to enjoy depending on how they participate in the auction. There are a number of ways where, that broadcasters can contribute spectrum to the cause and receive uh, a portion of auction proceeds but still stay on the air and fulfill their mission as broadcasters. So we think those are um, pretty unique, probably once-in-lifetime business opportunities, and we've been encouraging broadcasters to explore those and consider those as we develop our rules. Um, another goal is to preserve high-quality broadcast service for non-participating broadcasters after the auction. So those bro broadcasters who choose not to participate, many will probably have to be moved to new frequencies, but in that move, we hope to, um, it's our goal to preserve um, their contours, their broadcast contours and their audience in um, uh, consistent with the statute as well as cover their costs of moving, uh, which I'll explain a little more later in the presentation. We also have certain uh, fiscal objectives. Uh, first of all, this auction needs to break even. We can't pay to broadcasters more dollars than we take in from bidders who are seeking wireless licenses in the forward auction. Uh, so we have to break even. We have to cover our costs. And we have to cover uh, the costs of reimbursing broadcasters who need to move in the repacking following the auction. Um, and there are other congressional objectives that were identified as possible funding candidates in the statute. Uh, for, ex for example, $7, million, $7 billion for um, FirstNet. And, of course, deficit reduction is always uh, a target for um, um, a spectrum auction funds. And finally, given the innovation uh, that's going on in the mobile market, we as the FCC don't want a shortage of spectrum to stand in the way of continued innovation and job creation and economic growth that comes from this sector. So by finding a mechanism, a market-based mechanism, to move spectrum to wireless broadband uses, we feel that we're contributing to uh, the growth of innovation and vibrancy in the mobile market. So this slide attempts to illustrate what we're doing um, there's a lot going on in the slide, but just to walk you through it on a very high level, you see on the left uh, is what we're calling the reverse auction. That's what I've explained. That's the phase where broadcasters will decide to give their spectrum back to the FCC in exchange for proceeds. On the right, we have something called the forward auction, and that's the auction uh, which is much more of a, a traditional auction where wireless broadcasters, uh, sorry, wireless uh, companies will bid on licenses for wireless broadband. Now, the trick is this auction, this two-sided auction, um, is both supply-driven for the reverse auction, but it's also demand-driven. So what our challenge is to balance the reverse auction with the forward auction and to create a mechanism by which the demand that's expressed 
by wireless companies on the right side in the forward auction is met by the supply that we create through broadcasters contributing their their uh, spectrum in the reverse auction. One of the things we asked in the NPRM is how shall we integrate these? Do we do them in serial fashion? Do we do them simultaneously? Um, and we have um, some world-leading auction design experts helping us through those questions as we speak. Um, this list, uh, these points one through seven, also illustrate the topics that we did cover in the NPRM, which we issued last September. Um, what options broadcasters have to participate, uh, which I'll go over shortly. Um, how should we design the auction itself? How should we repack the broadcasters after the auction? Uh, what should the forward auction design look like? Once we determine that there's sufficient demand for wireless uh, spectrum, what should that new wireless band look like? That's the 600 megahertz band plan that we've um, uh, recently issued a public notice on seeking comments from the industry. Again, how do we integ integrate the forward and the reverse, au reverse auctions? And how do we build in unlicensed uh, spectrum and TV white spaces into the band plan resulting from the auction? So there are a lot of moving parts. They're very complex. Uh, but we're still on track to uh, propose rules uh, this year to the, the commissioners. As we design the auction, there are certain goals uh, that we believe are critical to the success of the auction. The first one is simplicity. I know I just showed a slide that was very complex, and I described how complex the auction is. But in order for broadcasters to participate, we believe that their participation needs to be made as simple as possible with very few tough decisions to make. We don't want broadcasters to have to hire complex game theorists or pricing experts or lawyers to participate. So we want the design to be very simple. Uh, we want the spectrum design to be very efficient. We want to try to repurpose the maximum amount of spectrum that we can um, for, for the lowest cost um, and with the most simple repacking on the back end. That's a goal of um, – a very important goal in designing the auction. And finally, of course, transparency. I mean, we need to be transparent in everything we do, but we also believe, given the broad range of stakeholders in this auction, transparency is critical to make sure everyone uh, who will be impacted by this feels like they have, um, that they are sufficiently bought in because they sufficiently understand it. So with respect to participating, um, and one goal I have for this audience is to the extent there are any state or uh, locally owned um, stations, broadcast stations that might be considering participating in the auction, these next slides um, would be important for you. Uh, who is eligible to contribute their station? Uh, right now, participation is limited to full power and Class A stations only because those stations have primary interference protection, and that's what we're asking stations to give up and give back to us in exchange for auction proceeds. Um, low power television stations and translators are not eligible to participate in the auction because they don't have that primary interference protection uh, th uh, that um, we're off that we're um, exchanging for auction proceeds. So that's why low power television is not uh, Congress did not authorize them to participate at this time. Now I mentioned before that there are multiple ways to participate. Um, we've spoken about going off the air. That's very straightforward. Um, a station will hand in its license and essentially uh, shut off the power and go dark and cease all operations in exchange for the share of auction, auction proceeds that we give them. But what may be of interest to state-owned um, to uh, uh, state -owned stations or systems are two other possibilities. One is um, channel sharing, and the other is the station moving from UHF to VHF. Each of these options allow the station to stay on the air broadcasting, but also receive some auction proceeds. Uh, the first such option is channel sharing, 
And the concept there is that rather than stay on one 6 megahertz channel, one broadcaster, um, two broadcasters could share one 6 megahertz channel. We think this opportunity would be appropriate for stations that currently aren't using, um, a, a station that isn't using all of its bandwidth, for example, uh, stations that can't afford to program multiple streams of content and that only perhaps are broadcasting one stream of content. Uh, that station could pair up with another similar station. Both of them could stream their single stream on a six megahertz channel and sell the other channel in the auction. Um, in this scenario, uh, each station would still retain its must carry rights, and to the extent most the, to the extent the station has most of its audience through must carry and, and cable and satellite systems, then its audience would uh, be preserved through through channel sharing. Um, Similarly, channel sharing stations would maintain their call letters and their channel guide numbers and other um, indicia of their station identity. And uh, we believe that this will reduce viewer confusion and disruption when the two channels, when the two stations combine on one channel. Uh, we think this is attractive because the channel sharing stations can maintain most of their revenue stream and uh, share whatever auction proceeds came from uh, contributing the other channel, uh, the other uh, channel to the auction. <coughs> Excuse me. The other option is moving uh, from UHF to VHF. In this option, if there's a station that is on a UHF channel, and UHF is what we plan on auctioning to the wireless carriers, um, if that station is willing to move to VHF, we believe there's an opportunity for a share of auction proceeds, and again, substantial preservation of that station's business model. In this opportunity, um, the station, unlike channel sharing, the station that moves to VHF keeps all of its 6 megahertz, so it can still uh, stream multicast streams. It also retains its must-carry rights. Now, its coverage uh, area might have more interference, so there's a trade-off there. It might have a smaller, those red circles in the bottom of the screen represent maybe pockets of interference that the station would inherit going to VHF, um, but that station would be compensated for that, and, and it would need to price that um, uh, interference loss into its bid in the auction. Um, maybe mobile broadcast would be difficult for the, in this scenario, but... TV everywhere is becoming um, a more and more popular and apparent alternative to mobile uh, DTV, so that might not be a constraint on this option either. But again, this is another option that allows the station to stay on the air but also receive um, uh, money in the form of auction, a share of the auction proceeds. Uh, we focus a lot on public television stations. The public television sta uh, the station sector has some unique challenges and also opportunities. There's a high concentration of public television stations in some markets. Some think public television is actually overbuilt in certain markets. This incentive auction would give them um, an opportunity to right size and, again, receive a capital infusion to fund programming. That's particularly important at a time when states are cutting uh, their public television budgets. Um, we think channel sharing, we've been working with the public television community on channel sharing and we're exploring maybe even doing a pilot. Um, but we think channel sharing is an opportunity to rationalize the, the sector and trim a lot of duplicative programming that's out there um, and even increase efficiencies in um, not only programming but fundraising too. Um, so to the extent, uh, for this audience, to the extent there are any long lead actions that could f facilitate putting a state-owned station into the auction, we would, we would uh, encourage you to look at those long lead items now in order to prepare yourself to participate at the time of the auction. Um, so, for example, are there any restrictions in the station's uh, state law for participating in the auction? Does the state-owned station have an organizing charter that needs to be amended, and are, are any uh, legislative actions required for that? Or are there any other uh, relevant restrictions that would take a long time correcting? 
uh, we, you know, are welcome, you know, we welcome your questions in this area um, because it is complex if you don't deal with it every day. So to the extent um, anyone has questions about their uh, state-owned stations and how they could participate, by all means, uh, you can contact us uh, through, through Greg. Then a few words after the auction, as I mentioned before, uh, the remaining television stations are likely to be assigned new frequencies. We refer to that as repacking. Um, our goal, of course, is to do this expeditiously and to minimize viewer disruption. Um, you, all, you all may remember the DTV transition. We tried to minimize viewer disruption there. We think that there will be less viewer disruption in this transition. And in the NPRM, we ask a number of questions about how we should conduct that transition in order to minimize viewer disruption. Another difference between this and the DTV transition is that in this transition, broadcasters will be reimbursed for their reasonable transition costs. Congress set aside $1.75 billion in a fund for us to reimburse broadcasters their costs. This fund does expire three years after the end of the auction, so there is a time limit on us. Um, and so we are going to endeavor to affect this transition as efficiently and quickly as possible to ensure that all broadcasters are duly uh, reimbursed. And finally, if you have um, any questions, there's um, a, a very robust collection of information at uh, www.fcc.gov slash learn program. There um, you will find a, a big long list of frequently asked questions, copies of the notices, the NPRM that I've discussed about, uh, other public notices and related rules are there. Uh, we have some narrative descriptions of um, proposed auction design, uh, band plans, um, interference proposals, there are also a number of archived webinars um, on a variety of these topics, like channel sharing and the reimbursement fund and the band plan. Um, and uh, there are also links to uh, allow people to comment on open proceedings. So uh, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend that you uh, check out this website. And with that, I'll take whatever questions people have. Thanks, Rebecca. That was uh, very helpful. And... Um, I, I think it's good that you pointed out to everybody out there on the uh, web watching from state and local governments that, yeah, every state is going to have a state and local, you're going to have either a state-owned or a local government-owned uh, station, if not both and multiples. So it's something um, that, that uh, state and local governments need to think about um, as well as uh, our uh, commercial broadcasters. So. And they should be thinking about, about that now. I can't stress that enough. Okay. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Rebecca. And you could uh, send uh, questions to Rebecca or to myself, gregory.vadis at fcc.gov, and I'll be happy to get them to Rebecca. Um, that's great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Jeffrey Steinberg, uh, Deputy Chief in the Spectrum and Competition Policy Division in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau. Uh, Jeffrey's going to give us a um, – in update on uh, wireless, uh, on, uh, on uh, infrastructure issues, wireless uh, infrastructure issues. And uh, I think a lot of you out there in uh, state and local governments probably know Jeff. You've worked with him um, in the NEPA context, in tower siting, and uh, I know Jeff has done the CERC and sp uh, spoke at NACO. So um, he's a stalwart, and uh, we're very pleased to have him, have him here today. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Greg. Um, so we're... I guess I'm at the end of a long day here. Yeah. I'm going to try to be, you know, I, I'll tell you what I think you need to know, but also be fairly brief and want to be kind of informal in this presentation. Um, essentially what I'm looking to do here is just, as Greg said, give you a short update on some of the infrastructure issues pending in the Wireless Bureau, particularly as they affect state and local governments. Um, the big development, of course, that we've had in the last few months is the City of Arlington decision. Um, and in that decision, the Supreme Court upheld the FCC's authority to have issued the shot clock ruling back in 2009 that interpreted Section 332C7 of the Communications Act. Um, now, I think that um, 
that, that ruling has a lot of potential implications in terms of administrative law practice generally. I'm not going to discuss those here. Um, for purposes of the siting of wireless facilities, though, I think that it really doesn't mean much more than that we're going to stay the course. Um, if the decision had gone the other way, there would still you know, be more litigation. There would be thoughts about, you know, what is this going to mean in the long term? Um, but the court upheld the ruling. So as it does stand, really what it means is that the law that you've already been operating under for three years is going to remain in effect. Um, now, of course, um, in the course of a good government, we are plan- going to continue to review the operation of the of the um, principles in the shot clock ruling. Um, you know, potentially, I'm not saying that they won't change. Um, you know, we could decide that based on experience that there ought to be clarifications or some changes one way or another. Um, but that's the sort of thing that we were planning to do anyway. I don't think that the shot clock, the Supreme Court's decision in itself, um, really changes the way the FCC is looking at that ruling and, and that statutory provision. So now moving on to looking ahead. Um, We've been discussing for quite some time, and and this has been stated before, having a notice of proposed rulemaking ready at the staff level that the commission could vote on this summer that would address various wireless infrastructure issues. And that is still our plan to have that ready if the commissioners choose to act upon it. I would say at this point, um, in terms of time frame, probably about the earliest that there could realistically be a vote on an item like that would be August, but I think that action sometime within the next quarter is a very real possibility. Now, all of this, of course, is depending upon, you know, what the acting chairwoman and the commissioners decide to do, but I think it's just to give you an outline of what might be in such an item, the NPRM could have several sections. Now, some of that is, would relate mostly to the FCC's environmental rules and processes, which I expect would have little direct effect upon state and local governments other than maybe your state historic preservation officers or if there are anyone from tribal nations on this webinar, your cultural resource professionals. Um, In particular, as part of that, the item might examine the application of our environmental and historic preservation rules to distributed antenna systems and to small cells. I think at this point, most people have a pretty general familiarity with those are. Um, Basically, this is um, increasingly common technology under which um, the existing large, you know, macro cells, as we call them, on the towers are replaced or or more often supplemented by um, a system of of much smaller and lower mounted antennas, many more of them, and this is a way to increase capacity as well as to get coverage to some hard to reach um, urban areas, primarily urban. Um, At any rate, because our rules were formulated before these things existed, um, the sense is that they're not really well tailored or well suited to um, everything involved in these systems. So we may be, you know, beginning in this item to take a look at that. Um, another thing primarily involving FCC rules would be that last month the commission um, granted a general waiver from our notice requirement under the environmental rules for certain temporary towers and um, indicated at that point that they would be commencing a rulemaking to to think about codifying that in the rules. Um, More direct interest, most likely, to to state and local governments, however. Um, I expect that it's likely that an NPRM would request comments on various issues relating to the interpretation of Section 6409A of the 2012 Tax Act. Now, that is the provision that says that a state or local government may not deny and shall approve, those are the statute's words, an eligible application for co-location, replacement, or modification of an existing wireless tower or base station. In a January 25th public notice, the Wireless Bureau offered some staff guidance on the interpretation of some issues under this provision, um, and that's available on the FCC's website. Um, the, the number is DA12-2047. Um, now, I expect that there's a, it's likely that an NPRM 
would um, work off of the staff guidance, um, might ask some questions about whether the commission should adopt provisions of the staff guidance as an official policy or rule, um, should change that guidance in any way, as well as asking about other questions arising potentially under 6409A that the staff guidance did not address. Um, and I just want to, you know, for your um, you know, edificate, you know, just run through some of the questions that might be in, um, in such a, um, NPRM. Um, one set of questions might involve, at a broad level, the extent to which the FCC should prescribe rules under Section 6409A at all. Um, other alternatives might include allowing additional experience for, um, for, in, in, in terms of the administration of that statute, um, as well as development of voluntary agreements or best practices. Um, another set of questions might revol revolve around what does the statute mean by existing wireless tower or base station? Um, and that include, in turn would raise several other sub-questions. What is a tower? What exactly is a base station? Um, what is the difference between a tower and a base station? And does it really matter for purposes of the statute which one something is? Also, what's meant by existing in this context? Um, so there, there are a number of questions there that the statutory language itself doesn't address. Um, also, what, what is covered by the statute um, in, in the term, again, in wireless tower or base station, what is meant by wireless in this context, both in terms of the structure that something is being co-located on and the service that the antenna that you are putting on or changing needs to um, provide. Also, what's meant by transmission equipment. Um, the statute goes to um, location modification of transmission equipment. What exactly does that encompass? Um, what's meant by a substantial change in the physical dimensions? The statute provides that if there is a substantial change in physical dimensions, then the requirement of may not deny and shall approve does not apply. Um, Bureau offered some staff guidance on what that means, but um, you know, does that need to be um, addressed, refined in any way? Um, for example, if there are different kinds of structures involved, would that be different from a tower that is built specifically for the purpose of providing wireless communications? What exactly is meant by may not deny and shall approve? Does it literally mean that as long as an application falls within the four corners of the statute, um, as the language on the face would, would seem to imply that it may never be denied? If there are exceptions to that, exactly what are those exceptions? How does this provision relate to um, provisions of the zoning code under which the, the local government may have originally approved the tower or conditions that may have been placed upon the tower at the time it was approved. Um, are there any limits implied in Section 6409A on the procedures that a local government or a state government may use um, in, in considering applications? Um, are there any time limits implied? And if so, what are they? Um, and finally, what are the remedies in, in cases where um, a violation may be found? Are they the same as what, what the FCC um, found under Section 332C7? Or does the fact that there is different statutory language um, mean that, that the remedial scope may be different? Um, one more thing, the NPRM may also seek comment on some issues relating to Section 332C7, the older provision um, dating back to the 1996 Act um, that governs um, state and local review of applications both for co-locations and new facilities. Um, among other things, that there might be um, a proposal to codify the, um, the principles set forth in the shot clock ruling. Um, and in doing so, the Commission might also choose to seek comment on whether those should be clarified or changed. Um, some possible examples, um, do we need to clarify further uh, when an application is complete to trigger the, the timelines that were set forth? Um, how does the ruling apply in the context of a moratorium? Um, and also, there may be a need to clarify how it applies to DAS and small cell. Those are just throwing out a, you know, a few things that conceivably could be there. Um, just one final word. I've been talking um, basically about upcoming rulemaking, um, but I do want to put in a plug as well for, um, for voluntary best practices. You know, we, 
encouraged by um, reports that we've been hearing of um, discussions between local government organizations and industry organizations uh, on some principles, uh, mutually agreed principles for um, for um, implementing, in particular, Section 6409A um, may also be some spillover to 332C7. Um, looking forward to hearing more about how those discussions are going. I think that you know voluntary agreements in an area like this, and and I think this is generally the Commission's view, can be a very productive means of either. You know, avoiding the need for prescriptive rules um, or um, supplementing those rules, you know, keep, be helping to keep any any rules and uh, commission interpretations that are necessary down to a minimum, or they could be the the basis for the commission um, then acting on something in a, in a broad sense. But at any rate, um, you know, we, we always like to see consensus, and we we do encourage that process to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, boy, it sounds to me like the uh, Wireless Bureau might, it's, it's been busy uh, drafting and working on some of these things. And certainly um, uh, in our Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, we've, we've heard from state and local governments. And um, I know Jeff and his team reach out to you guys on a regular basis. So um, that's, what, uh, that, that's what the Wireless Bureau is, um, is uh, uh, working on drafting and hopefully um, it's responding to some of the concerns that we've heard from you all over the last couple of months since since January. Um, we really want to do our best to work together and um, be light on the regulation, I think, as Jeff has said. We actually have a, uh, a uh, question from uh, Mitzi Herrera at the uh, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, Cable and Broadcasting Administrator. Mitzi says, will the FCC NPRM address the issues of whether any tower or antenna modifications must comply with, applic with applications of safety codes, I guess um, safety codes from the county or the state? For example, severe storms are routine occurrences in the D.C. area. National safety codes have been upgraded to require that facilities meet higher wind ratings. However, existing facilities are only required to be upgraded when modifications are made. Will the FCC's NPRM address the issue of whether state and local governments may continue to condition approvals and modifications subject to the applicant meeting all required safety codes? Well, thank you. That's a, um, that's a good point, um, and I think that is certainly um, you know, an issue that could be addressed in the NPRM. It's something that we have been thinking about. Thanks, Mitzi. Um, anybody else? Any, any other questions from our friends in state and local governments? By the way, we saved Jeff for last on purpose. We knew we'd have a bunch of questions and, uh, and the uh, uh, co-location, um, uh, uh, tower co-locations would be of interest to you. So it was a way to, it was a way to hold you all. Anybody? All right. Um, if you have any questions for Jeff or any of the other speakers, um, so it's uh, jeffrey.steinberg at fcc.gov or Certainly feel free to reach out to myself uh, or any members of my team, um, gregory.vadis at fcc.gov. I run the Intergovernmental Affairs Office here at the FCC, and uh, we work uh, closely with all the bureaus, um, work more closely with some than others. I regularly uh, pick up the phone and talk to Jeff or email him, and sometimes Jeff cringes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, in all seriousness, we have a, we have a great working relationship. So. Um, so uh, please uh, uh, send me any questions, concerns, and I know, um, as evidenced by uh, the questions Jeff rattled off, that the Wireless Bureau is thinking about in the NPRM. Your your concerns certainly make their their way to the um, to the different bureaus and and to staff. And uh, as we fill out with the full commission, we'll see what eventually is put out there. But certainly on the um, staff level, um, we're, we're able to uh, communicate all the issues and then and then capture your concerns and get those up to, to the commissioners to decide what ultimately makes it into the items. So thank you. Okay, that's it for, um, for this uh, edition of uh, the FCC State and Local Government Webinar. Thank you again to, uh, I wanted to also um, thank all the uh, state and local organizations for um, helping spread the word to their members uh, throughout the country. So thank you.
Thanks, Josh. Yeah.